Okay, so again, we are going to dive into um, this or that, what I'm calling this or that mammal edition. This whole presentation um, is inspired by a field guide, which I'll mention in a second. But these are the species that we're going to be exploring, which you should have seen when you registered for this webinar. So we're going to look at the eastern cottontail rabbit versus the marsh rabbit, the Florida panther versus the bobcat, and then the gray squirrel versus what we are now calling the southern fox squirrel. You may have heard of it referred to as the Sherman fox squirrel, which is not incorrect. We have just, we have new data <laughs> to show that it's now being reclassified and we're now calling it this excuse me, the southern fox squirrel. So again, this presentation is inspired by a field guide called This or That. It was the backdrop of the title screen. I will mention this again. If you enjoy today's presentation and want way more, this field guide will do that for you. I do also want to apologize in advance. <coughs> I'm getting a overgold. I have tried all the, I have all the teas and things around me. So if I pause to take a sip, it's just so hopefully you can have a more, more enjoyable experience on today's webinar. I do plan to keep this pretty brief um, and we'll see if I can hold to that just to keep it a nice actual lunch and learn. So we're gonna jump right in looking at our first species comparison. So we're looking at again, the Eastern cottontail rabbit versus the marsh rabbit. And perhaps you didn't even know we had two different species of rabbit. That was probably the case for me for a long time. Um, but once you see a marsh rabbit, if they might be new to you, you'll be like, oh, yeah, they do look different and kind of act a little bit different compared to the eastern cottontail. So we're going to go over some ways on how to tell them apart. So first thing you want to look at is the tail or <laughs> the lack thereof. Um, so eastern cottontail, they get that name for a reason. Their tail is pretty large and obvious, anywhere from an inch and a half to up to two and a half inches big. So that's like, you know, a massive cotton ball. Um, and it's usually, usually you can see it, especially when they dart away, it's very obvious. Compared to the marsh rabbit, they do have a tail. Um, it's just much smaller, as big as it gets is one and a half inches. Um, and it's the same color as their body. So it doesn't really stand out or stick out from like it does on the Eastern cottontail. So that's one thing you can look for. The other thing that honestly, until you know these species really well, um, wouldn't be super obvious to you, but is the length of their ears. So the cottontail rabbit has a much larger ear or longer ear, I should say, compared to kind of the stubbier ears of the marsh rabbit. Now, again, sometimes common names are helpful. Um, and so when we're thinking about habitat and where we might see these species, the Eastern cottontail is kind of, we say like high and dry. They tend to like um, areas away from water, it, which is where you'll typically see them. That's why they're really common in residential areas because we build where it's high and dry, right? The marsh rabbit, as its name suggests, tends to be found in um, like wetter, what we'd call lowland or kind of swampy areas. And that is definitely the case for me. Anytime I've seen a marsh rabbit has been near a lake, near a pond. Um, we see them you know, near the, the creek here. So if there's water nearby, there's a higher chance you're gonna be seeing a marsh rabbit versus a cottontail. Um, of course, ra all rabbits have to drink. So you may see a cottontail near a body of water, but you will not be seeing a marsh rabbit like up you know, in the pine flatwoods where it's like super high and dry or an oak hammock area far away from water. So just kind of knowing where you are will also be helpful in um, trying to figure out which species it is that you are seeing. And then lastly is, I'm gonna talk about both the coloration as well as their eyes. So I'll just touch briefly on their eyes first, which you can see here, I always, <laughs> To me, the Eastern cottontail rabbit always looks like scared, like its eyes are kind of bulging. So their eyes are much bigger than, they tend to say, you'll often hear people refer to the beady eyes of the marsh rabbit. So the eyes are a little bit smaller. So that's one thing you can look for. In terms of coloration, the Eastern cottontail tends to be more of like overall gray, but obviously speckled in like kind of a peppered coat. And then one thing you can also look for is that 
the nape, the back of the neck. You can kind of see it in this image here. Um, it has a little bit of rust coloration. So that's somewhat of a distinguishing characteristic for them. And you can see over on the marsh rabbit, they tend to be more of like a reddish brown overall. Um, and then obviously with the black modeled in there and they do have a white underside, but it's, it's pretty rare that you're gonna get to see that belly. Anytime I see them, they're always like down in there trying to get something to eat. They're, in terms of behavior, I feel like they're definitely more like shy and timid, the marsh rabbit compared to the cottontail. It's a little bit more like on high alert and will quickly like dart away. <laughs> Okay, so again, I mentioned I'm going to throw in some pop quiz questions just to keep it interactive and engaging. So this is where you'll open your chat, not the Q&A, open your chat and um, type in your response there. So and I'm just working on one screen here. So true or false, it is important to identify species accurately because some management decisions depend on the presence or absence of certain species especially those listed as threatened, endangered, or invasive. So I'm gonna open my chat and you can type in either true or false since it's a short word. I'm gonna pause real quick and cough and get some water. <laughs> All right, yeah, most of you got it. I'm starting off easy. It'll get harder, I promise. <laughs> so yes, that answer is true. Um, and that was part of the inspiration for, for the field guide that we created as well is because there are a lot of species that look very similar or can be confused, but one of them is a listed species you know, under protection um, or another one could be invasive. So it's really important that we know which is which. So we're not, you know, if it's an invasive versus native that looks similar, we don't want to be removing the native species, right? We want to make sure we're targeting the correct one. Okay, so next up is the Florida panther versus the bobcat, which <clears throat> this one, right? It's obviously if you ever got to see a Florida panther in the wild, like I'm very jealous of you, <laughs> um, but it's very, very rare. But I do get this very often, especially working at the preserve, people will swear that they saw a Florida panther. So I just wanna go over some quick things and tips that you can look for so you know which one it is that you are seeing. Now, again, I will mention the Florida panther is listed as endangered at the federal level. There's only a couple hundred of them found throughout the entire state. So, and this actually is a map showing their um, range. So the blue is where they've been known to occur and the yellow is where is kind of their breeding area so you can see it's very very limited to kind of the central florida ridge and then down into southwest florida you will see no dots <laughs> in pinellas county um, or really nowhere really north of, or of orlando so that's just really important to keep in mind that's one of the things i whenever I teach about trees or anything else is knowing the range of a species like if you're up in the panhandle and you're like i saw a florida panther well, it's very, very unlikely that that is the case, <laughs> unless you're at a zoo, of course. So, and again, because they are so rare and both the bobcat and the Florida panther are more active at night. So we're often gonna see evidence of these species versus actually seeing them. So you can look for tracks. Of course, they're both wild cats. So their tracks are gonna look similar but we have to think about the size of these species. So a cougar track is basically twice the size of that of a bobcat. So you can see um, three and a half inches long and four inches wide. So a little bit wider than they are long for the cougar, which is just another term for the Florida panther. The bobcat much, much smaller, only about an inch and a half tall and then a little slightly under an inch and a half wide. And even kittens of the Florida panther, their tracks, even as kittens, are going to be larger than that of a, of a mature bobcat. Now, we have the pleasure of having a trail camera at Brooker Creek Preserve that we set out. We also have one of our um, chief rangers um, that sets them out as well to see what we might not always see when we're just out hiking the trails. Now this one of the Florida Panther is not 
one taken here at Brooker Creek Preserve, but I wanted to compare two trail camera images just so we are kind of comparing apples to apples. So here we want to look at both the tail and the ears. And I know these aren't the best quality images, but I promise it will get the point across. So for the tail of the Florida panther, they are incredibly long. <laughs> I think they say up to like two thirds of their body length is the length of the tail. So anywhere from 20 to 30 inches for the tail length of the Florida panther, compared to on average, the tail of a bobcat is four to six inches. So bobcat, short, like you think bob haircut, it's short. Um, so they have a short little kind of nubby tail. The other thing, the back of their ears is very, very distinct. So again, I know this is small, but on the bobcat, you can see there's like these flashes of white on the back of their ears. So it's basically like black and the spot of white and then black. It kind of looks like eyes on the back of their ears. That's a very distinguishing characteristic of the bobcat. On the Florida panther, it's just dark. It's all dark on the backside. So if you only get a quick flash and all you see is like white on the back of the ears, then that is very likely a bobcat. And then I've already alluded to the fact that the Florida panther is significantly larger than the bobcat. So of course there's differences between males and females, but anywhere from 60 up to 150 pounds is where we're gonna find the Florida panther in terms of size. Compared to the bobcat where at maturity, we're looking at max 35 pounds. So again, they're gonna be <laughs> significantly larger and heavier, the Florida panther. Coloration wise, I mean, it can be hard, especially only if you're seeing a flash. The Florida panther is pretty consistent in terms of its color. It's kind of this, they tend to say tawny color, um, yellowish brown, however you would describe what you're seeing on your screen, there's all different ways you can describe that color. But that's going to be pretty consistent throughout. With the exception, if you are blessed to see kittens of a Florida panther, they are spotted, which is similar to that of the bobcat. So the coat of bobcats is spotted throughout. It can kind of, in my experience, like an, a more mature older bobcat, the spots kind of like all blend together. It's not as distinct. But in general, you're going to see kind of a speckled coating. It's a little bit more distinct on the underside of the belly because the belly's white with the spots, so they stand out a little bit more. Um, so much smaller on the bobcat, spotted coat, much larger with the Florida panther, um, and distinct kind of coating throughout. And again, remember that range. It's I'm I, you never want to say never in science, but it's incredibly, extremely unlikely that you will ever see a Florida panther in Pinellas County, again, with the exception of like at the state fair or something. Okay, so here's my next level poll question for you guys. Which agency is responsible for listing species protection, like if they're listed as threatened or endangered, at the state level? And is it the Environmental Protection Agency, Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, Florida Department of Environmental Protection, or the Nature Conservancy of Florida? And you can just put A, B, C, or D for this one. And I'm again gonna mute and look at your responses. Okay, so there's a couple mixed responses. I've seen a mix of anywhere from B to C to D. No one thinks A, so that's good. <laughs> so the correct answer is the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. So, and I'll kind of talk a little bit more about that with our next species comparison. I just wanna see how I'm doing with time. Perfect, okay. So, this is the last species comparison that we will do, looking at two different species of squirrel. And again, you might be like with the rabbit, perhaps you're like, I didn't even know we had two species. So perhaps you're in the same boat with squirrels, but we do. Um, and so we're gonna explore those now. 
So we're going to be looking at the southern fox squirrel and the eastern gray squirrel. People often just drop the eastern and call them gray squirrels. Same with fox squirrel. Most people just call them fox squirrels, which is good because as I mentioned again at the beginning, their name of Sherman's fox squirrel has been changed to now southern fox squirrel. And they are still considered a species of special concern. Now I will mention that that classification by the FWC, the Florida Fish and Wildlife, remember our poll question, is gonna be going away. So FWC is trying to get in line with the federal listings of endangered and or threatened and endangered. And so by having the species of special concern, it was just kind of making things a little bit confusing. So they're going away with this, it will either be, they're gonna assess the species and determine if they need to be listed as threatened or just delisted altogether. Um, and that can be at the state or federal level. And I won't get too much into that, but this will um, title will be going away eventually. They still need more information and for the Southern Fox Squirrel to make that determination. So there is a specific management plan for all the species that are listed as species of special concern. Um, and once they get the information that they need to make that decision, it will be made. So for telling the difference from these two species, okay, size is like number one. The Southern Fox squirrel is giant. We just saw one, this is actually a picture from um, that my colleague Julia, who's co-hosting this webinar for me took. We were just driving in the county vehicle into, into the preserve and he was just chilling there and then jumped off the tree. They are sometimes called a monkey squirrel because they have that black face and they are big. So people will be like, was that a monkey? The answer is no, but we can see why you're confused. So basically the gray squirrel, much smaller. The maximum size of a gray squirrel is like the starting size of a mature Southern fox squirrel. They can get to be up to 40 inches from the tip of their nose to the tip of the tail. That's like, that's massive. Um, that's like, of course, the max, but it said 24 to 40 inches. Um, whereas the gray squirrel is max is 20 inches from the tip of the nose to the tip of the tail. So size alone should help you figure that out. If not, um, coloration is another thing that you can look for. But I will say, um, I was doing a little bit of research on the coloration because they can vary quite significantly, especially in the Southern Fox Squirrel. There was actually one study that said it is the Southern, or the Fox Squirrel in general, we'll just make it broad, is the most variable in color of all mammal species in the United States. So I know that's not helpful for you, but um, there's, within Florida even, there's six defined color morphs that are, have been classified. <laughs> I won't dive into those details yet either, but um, yeah, it's been studied and it's a thing. So you might see one that's more like white um, here and some that are like almost completely black looking. Some will have a white belly. Some bellies will be even more rust colored. So all around highly variable. The Eastern gray squirrel also, <laughs> has different color morphs. In general though, the majority are gray, hence their name, with a white belly. Um, I will say there's one <clears throat> that lives just outside my house here that tends to be, it not tends to be, it is um, very, very rust colored on the belly. Like if you saw it quickly, you might be like, oh, was that a fox squirrel? Cause it's more like what you would think of in terms of colors that you see on a fox squirrel. But again, in general, they're gonna be gray with the white belly, much smaller, so color shouldn't really be like, size is gonna be the main thing to look for, but it's important to keep colors in mind as well. And one other fun thing, when I was doing my research for the fox squirrel, this is looking at the Eastern fox squirrel. So kind of just broadening our scope here, not just what we have here in Florida. And they found that darker color morphs were more, were positively associated with areas that saw more frequent prescribed fires and lighter coats were found where there was larger acres of cropland. So fox squirrels do highly depend on habitat that has prescribed fire. They have preference for kind of low understory, which fires are 
keep out that dense vegetation and more of an open tree canopy. So all very, very interesting, very cool if you wanna nerd out on that science. <laughs> and then in terms of habitat, so I just kind of alluded to the Southern Fox Squirrel. They, it's not like the gray squirrel that we all see, it's in our neighborhood, it's eating out of our bird feeder, they're just literally everywhere. <laughs> Um, the southern fox squirrel is a little bit more, I guess, selective in where it is being found. So they do tend to like larger open natural areas. They're very well known for being seen at Innisbrook Golf Course because, again, it has that nice, very open understory, open tree canopy. There's a few trees, but not a ton. Um, so that's kind of like their ideal habitat, I guess, in an urban setting, <laughs> if you will. Um, and again, when I was doing my research, they did say that historically what we were saying is these are only going to be found in these natural areas. And now what we're finding is that they are more adaptive than we originally thought. Um, so they are taking up residence in more like suburban areas like Innisbrook um, and just kind of learning to adapt and survive with human influences. So that's, I guess, a good thing that they are adapting. <clears throat> now, one thing that we, oh, oops, sorry about that, that we always like to include in our presentation, I don't know why it's automatically advancing, I'll, I'll just keep hitting back maybe, um, is that we want to help support conservation, if it keeps advancing, I'll just talk um, through this, but all of these species really rely on large open landscapes. And so anything that we can do to support that, whether it's, um, you know, if you have property and you can invest it in a land trust, supporting any acts of wildlife corridor or wildlife conservation, um, there's all sorts of different organizations and groups that conduct restoration efforts, whether it's tree planting. I know they're going to be doing a bunch of living shoreline projects at um, Philippi Park and um, they just did a big tree planting down at Fort DeSoto. So anything we can do to restore habitat is going to benefit all species, right? Um, the Florida panther, of course, down in South Florida needs massive, massive acres of land. And we can only do that through big conservation efforts. But there's tons of ways that you can get involved. Um, and even if you can't like physically get involved, whatever the case, you can still voice your opinion. You can reach out to your elected officials. Um, and just let people know your thoughts. Or um, there's tons of friends groups as well. Like we have a Friends of Brooker Creek Preserve. I know there's Friends of Island Parks. There's all sorts of, within our parks and preserves, that a lot of them have friends groups. So if you have one you're passionate about or really love to visit, you could think about getting involved that way. So again, these are the species that we went over for our quick lunch and learn. Cottontail versus marsh rabbit, Florida panther versus bobcat and the gray squirrel versus the southern fox squirrel. I do just wanna mention a couple of resources before I wrap up. So I basically have a blog version of what I just did. If you're more of, if you like to learn through reading, which is not me, but I made a blog for you. Um, it's just called Commonly Confused Mammals of Florida. And it goes through everything again that I just went through in my presentation today. If you are more of a visual learner, Again, we have a YouTube channel. You can use this short link that you see on your screen or honestly, you can just search um, Pinellas County Extension YouTube and you could subscribe so you stay tuned with what's there or you can just explore all the videos that we have available on our site. There's different playlists that you can look at. Um, it's like an endless supply of resources for you, really. And this is where this webinar will be posted. I do have within that YouTube playlist or within that YouTube channel, there is a playlist called This or That. Um, and there are, again, the species comparisons that I went over today. If you just need like a quick refresher, these are like two and three minute videos that you can watch on demand. Again, the field guide that inspired this presentation and more that will be coming your way. Um, it's a field guide that me and my colleague, James Stevenson wrote, it's available through the Nature Store. You can purchase it at the Nature Store at Brooker Creek Preserve or through the UF IFAS Bookstore. The funds do not support Lara Milligan or James Stevenson. <laughs> they go into our program funds so we can offer more awesome programs for you. 
I do also have a podcast that me and my colleague in Polk County um, put together. We release episodes once a month. They're just 15 to 20 minute episodes. So if you are into podcasts or maybe you want to try it out, you can search for Naturally Florida and subscribe there. And of course, I have to plug our wildlife safari coming up on the first Saturday in April. If you have kids or grandkids or nieces or nephews that you want to get out of the house, this is an awesome event. Live animals. The kids love it. It is F-R-E-E, -E, which everybody loves. And that will be at Brooker Creek Preserve as well from 10 to 2. You just come, come whenever you want between those hours. Thank you guys for tuning in for today's Lunch and Learn and enjoy the rest of your week.